How many of you guys are old enough or have watched enough YouTube to remember, and now for something completely different? <laughs> All right, so uh, how many of you guys have been to a presentation of mine before or seen stuff on like YouTube and crap like this? This is not really like that, okay? Um, what I'm going to go through is uh, more on the economic patterning side of things. You know, as a trained permaculturist, I think through that lens. We plan from the pattern down to the details. And if you start at the details, and let's just take um, like mycorrhizae fungi, the previous course in here. If you're thinking about mycorrhizae fungi and only mycorrhizae fungi, you will never be able to build the whole entire complete system starting with mycorrhizae fungi. And you're going to be so tunnel visioned in mycorrhizae, it's all about mycorrhizae, and you'll never really take it beyond that. You can't take a bolt and build an airplane. You have to have this big master plan. Well, it comes to our enterprises as well on the land, the real estate, where we're, where we're doing our farming activity. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be sharing a lot of things from personal experience. This is what I have done, and this is what I am currently doing and working with and involved with. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a tax accountant. I'm not a certified public accountant. Um, I'm giving no advice to anybody anywhere because I'm not legally allowed to do so. We theoretically have this free speech, but no, we don't. There are things that I'm going to be talking about here that if I were to tell you this, say, this is a good way to do it, it's against the law, and they clap me in chains and put me in jail. How do you like that for free speech? But what I'm going to be doing is I'm showing an example of what I've done, what I've been doing, and how it all works. Um, first of all, that's New Forest Farm, southwest Wisconsin. Uh, it's 20, this picture was taken like 15 years into the development of it. I've been doing this for 30 years now on a number of different properties all across the country that are under my uh, management. And then I do it consulting for, for others around the world, three different continents. And basically this is kind of how we structure things um, when we're doing it. And part of the whole premise where we're starting with is this right here, annual grains and legumes, annual cropping in general, um, annual crops have a place in the economy of nature. They follow a disturbance. A tree, wind blows a tree over, there's disturbed soil. Silt is deposited on a floodplain, there's disturbed soil. The annual plants colonize rapidly, they grow real fast, they accumulate a lot of uh, carbon in their above ground, in their roots, and they make these hard seeds that will last a long, 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 long time, because when they fall to the ground, they might not have the right conditions to sprout for 100, 200, 300, 1,000 years when the next disturbance comes through. It's a beautiful strategy in nature. However, when we take 50% of the planet that used to be a perennial ecosystem, eradicate it, extract as much above ground value as we can, as much below ground value as we can, and then disturb it every single year, sometimes multiple times per year, dirt, 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 awful handful of seeds that we are not adapted, created, or evolved to eat. Our teeth, our dentition, and our digestive system it has two organs missing, one's a crop and one's a gizzard that are designed to, to eat these things. So, of course, we have a brain and we figured out how to make them so they don't kill us as fast. So that's why we get things like, you know, diabetes from too much carbohydrate in our diet. And we get, you know, all, all kinds of, you know, obesity complications, heart attack, et cetera, et cetera. Everywhere that this type of agriculture has been practiced, whenever a society has focused on this type of agriculture for its staple food crops, its proteins, carbohydrates, and oils, it's ended in collapse. Organic isn't the answer. You know, sustainable bionutrient isn't necessarily the answer. This is a certified organic farm right down the road from me. They're increasing the soil organic matter. They've got wildlife habitat islands. They're contour farm. They're doing everything right, and this is totally wrong. That's totally wrong. This is not sustainable. It's not regenerative. Let's just, yeah, run the manure down into the fields. Good idea. <clears throat> Every time a culture has depended on annual crops for its, its staple food crops, it's ended up in a collapse. All the time, do your homework. Um, is it going to be any different for this go around doing annual agriculture? I'm not so sure it's going to be any different. We have to turn things around. Um, there's more grains and legumes being produced on this planet. Who was in the last workshop right here? Um, the lady was talking about how, no, this was the other one. This is a, just across the hall. I walked in here. That basically three major companies, ConAgra, Cargill, and whoever the third one, uh, they basically have all of the contracts for spur deliveries in and out of uh, 
uh, off the railways for the, like the next 20 years. And unless you're growing corn and beans, you can't get access to the real market because the transportation's all clogged with their stuff on contract. So if you're in a farmer in their area, you have to grow that stuff. Um, this is part of the problem. This is, this is a serious, huge problem. There is so much, you know, they're saying we can't feed the world with sustainable and organic and all that kind of stuff. Well, they're not feeding the world that this way either, and they're actually destroying it pretty darn fast. There's actually so much grain in surplus. There's just so much grain and legumes in surplus that we feed 80% of our corn and beans goes to feed cattle. Cattle, uh, they also are not designed, adapted, created, or evolved to eat grains and legumes. Um, and it takes 10 pounds of feed to make one pound of beef. So why not feed them things like sticks and grass that we can't digest instead of things that we actually turn into products that we eat that aren't really all that healthy, but that's a different conversation. 80% of our food, our food that's being produced, that means we have like 900% more food available for humanity if we stop feeding grains to livestock that aren't adapted, evolved to eat it. Another 15 to 17% goes into motor fuel. So we've got all this stuff being produced, all these markets, all these places to send it. That means all of us should be making a lot of money, right? Well, this, this isn't the most current data, but it's like some of the nearest I could find. Your average return uh, to, to the farmer um, is basically below zero, low price average yield or high yield. Low, even at a, a low price with a high yield, you're losing money on every acre that you're putting in the ground. And only when there's a high price and a high yield at the same time are you going to make any positive cash flow at all. It ain't working. It's not working. How many of you guys do any kind of farming at all? How many of you guys are getting filthy, stinking rich from your agricultural activity? Yeah, I didn't think so. Because the average uh, farm income from people who file an IRS Schedule F is below zero. Part of that below zero is a little bit deceiving because there are people who have income from somewhere else that don't want to pay taxes. So you put it into a farm and you spend all kinds of money on all kinds of inputs and this and that, the other thing. So it intentionally it loses money. So those of you who are trying to go out and actually earn some money by doing agriculture, you're competing against people who are trying to lose money, and that's really not a fair competitive advantage, is it? So the whole rabbit hole journey for me started way back when I was in my teens. You know, this idea bothered me. How can we design natural ecosystems? Uh, I studied engineering, got a job, hated it, studied ecology, um, couldn't get a job because it was a different administration that was into executing ecologists or something like that. So I decided to go out and jump out on a limb, get involved in a real estate deal, purchasing degraded property and upgrading it ecologically and planting it to perennial food crops that directly mimic the natural plant community types of an area. And we'll talk about that later. So how I structured it, I went to a whole bunch of these different get rich quick seminars. I'm a 24 year old college student, I'm $50,000 in debt. I haven't had a job since 1982. I go to all these different seminars and see how do these guys do this stuff, no money down real estate, okay. And this, I went to this one, paid like 500 bucks to go into this one, and how to buy real estate, no money down, do everything on credit cards and borrowing. It's like, whoa, cool. If you think about that, it's just math. It's just math, you got this number and this number and this number, you make the numbers work and everything's fine. The only problem is, if you don't pay the payments when you need to take your payments, they take all your stuff away. Okay, then you do it again. Whoa, all right. So got into this real estate in Southwest Wisconsin. This was actually, this is the eighth property that I got onto in doing the redesign and the rehab, the ecological rehab. I, this is the one that I've been on for the past 24 years. I think I'm better at it than when I, when I was 24, much better at it, and this is what I've done. And I'm not trying to say do this or whatever, but this is how I've done. How long is the average person who gets into agriculture starting new, not somebody who like inherited the farm or whatever it is, starting new, gets into agriculture, stays into agriculture, how long? Four years. Four years, you know why? It sucks, it just sucks. So some of these inspirations, you can do your own homework basic financial uh, prudence here, rich dad, poor dad, to think about being an investor instead of like the, his poor dad was the, the dad that says you go get a good job and you work for a career and you save a little money and maybe when you're my age at age 65, Social Security will still be there and you won't be too cancerous and half dead and you'll be able to retire in comfort in squalor in Flint, Michigan where we've been stuck for 30 years because I had this job. 
Asset Protection Bible. This is really like behind the wizard's curtain kind of thinking. It's all public domain information. You can go find the Asset Protection Bible by J.W. Mitten online, really cheap. And you read it, and it's like, this is just public domain forms and you know, business this and business that. But it's how it's put together that on the other side of the wizard's curtain, you go to their workshops and you pay big bucks to go to it, which I, of course, did. But not having a job, how did I go to those expensive workshops? Back then, you used to have to go with your credit card. Well, then you go like this with your credit card. Well, now you go like this with your credit card. Those are the three different financial gestures. Tai Chi. So anyways, that's technology. <laughs> the e-myth, why small, most small businesses fail. Uh, think about Joe the plumber. He works for his plumbing company. He makes 100 bucks his paycheck. With that 100 bucks, he's got to pay all of his bills. He's got to buy his car, his clothes, his tools, his everything. At the end of the week, he's got a dollar left over. He never makes a go of it. He decides to go ahead and turn himself into a private contractor. And he subcontracts with the same boss, but now I'm my own boss. Uh, the first $100 that I earn as your employee, I get taxed on the full $100. That means I only start with 75 bucks. And by the end of the week, I got a dollar. As my own private subcontractor, I start with $100, but I have costs of doing business, my business expenses, my uniforms, my advertising, my tools, my transportation. All these things are deductions from your income. Then you pay taxes on $26 left at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the week. No taxes on 26 bucks. You're all, all of a sudden 25% wealthier. Cool racket. Well, then he gets busier and busier and busier. Instead of just being the slob who goes in and tightens a pipe, he also has to call clients, he has to bill clients, he has to take care of the accountants for the clients, so now he's doing five times the work, yeah, he's getting more money. Well, then he wants to expand, because if I can get her, she's a young apprentice plumber, I can pay her 12 bucks an hour, but charge the client 25 bucks an hour, but there's not enough money in my system to be able to pay her and me, so I kind of don't take a pay raise, and I'm doing extra work, because now I'm managing an employee, so that if the person, who goes to be a private subcontractor on their own gets stuck in a situation that I got so much work I can't keep up with it, but I don't have enough revenue to expand to the scale that I need to. So this talks about how to overcome that. The nature has been my biggest teacher. Um, when I read, uh, Bill Mollison said, um, we need to observe nature, imitate nature, um, and then work within it and live within it, I believed him. And so I went and did that. And most permaculturists that I've seen don't do that. They may look at nature, but instead of actually observing nature, they're looking through the lens of their concepts, and they're seeing forest or orchard or field, uh, instead of actually immersing themselves in nature and saying, I am going to figure out how to live within this ecological system, period. I'm going to figure out how it grows and changes and reproduces. And could somebody get me a glass of water, Johan? Thanks. And the Universal School of Hard Knocks, if <laughs> <laughs> if any, anything here, if, I, if you ever hear me say, oh, it's easy, understand, well, yeah, I can do a lot of these things now because I'm, I'm practiced at it, but you're going to get up at, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning in the freezing rain, you're going to go to bed four hours after you should have gotten up in the first place, and you're going to have animals that are sick and things that are dying and stuff that needs to get harvested before frost. Farming's hard work. You know, farming's hard work. One of the things I want to point out, and this has to do with our concepts. We're going to talk about economic stuff here. I'm going to talk big picture. This is patterning. All of the details you guys have to figure out on your own. Um, too many people make the mistake, oh, I want to buy a farm, when they really mean, I want to buy a piece of real estate. It, we're now going to think of ourselves, we are real estate developers. I want to be a real estate typhoon, OK? This right here is the farm. It's you, you file an IRS Schedule F tax form. This is the production of agricultural crops, commodities, livestock for sale. This thing right here requires the ownership of no real estate. Most agricultural, most farms are actually renting a significant portion of their land. They don't own the land. You don't have to own the land. So people say, oh, I, young people want to get into farming. You saw, I saw him and he smiled. He got this little smirk but they can't afford to buy the land. It's like, you don't have to. You don't need to own the land to farm. You farm the land and you pay a rent, or you don't pay a rent, or whatever the situation is. 
This right here, the IRS Schedule F farm, we already looked at the statistics back here. Whoop, right there, doesn't pay. Doesn't pay, get over it. If you wanna to come to a workshop and learn about how to make millions in farming, they're lying. There are exceptions. There, <laughs> and farm till it's gone. Or you inherit a whole bunch of land from daddy and you don't have the, the overhead expenses that somebody else does. That's a huge way to get involved and not you know, go under right away. This right here, let's just start with our thinking, is not gonna pay for the whole thing because we're real estate developers. So what we're gonna do as a real estate developer, we're now gonna develop this property, this real estate, and we're going to rent land, lease land, to an IRS Schedule F that's gonna farm a particular way. And the way it farms is going to take care of the asset. It's going to improve the value of this real estate by doing restoration agriculture. It's gonna be doing alley cropping with trees, shrubs, bushes, and vines, rotational grazing, all of the things we go all these workshops for. That's the kind of farming that this farmer is going to do. They're obligated to because we won't <laughs> rent to them if they're not gonna do it that way. Then we're gonna to rent to some sort of business. How I did it is started New Forest Farms, LLC. That's the farm that actually produces uh, produce, nuts, um, livestock, et cetera, for sale. IRS Schedule C, in my case, was a nursery. I needed to plant uh, 100 apple rootstock on my farm, and I, back in the days you had catalogs, and at the time I could have bought 100 rootstock for let's say like a dollar a piece, it's 100 bucks, but if I bought 500 rootstock, I could get them for 50 cents a piece if I bought them bulk. So I went to an apple orchard guy and said, hey Mike, can I order uh, 400 apple rootstock for you? You need 400? He's like, yeah, sure, I'm you know, grafting all the time, order me 400. So I look at the catalog and so I'm gonna order 400. He's gonna pay for his, I'm gonna get mine at the 500 rate. Well, then I noticed to get 1,000, it was only like 50 bucks more. It's like, whoa. So I bought 1,000 rootstocks, I put in 100, gave Mike his 400. Now I'm stuck, I got 500 apple rootstocks, what do I do with those? I sell them to you and to you and to you and to you and to you because, hey, look at the catalog price. You wanna buy an apple rootstock? $3.75, but I'll let, him, let you have them for two bucks. So all of a sudden you get a deal and I have what's called a business. Now I'm in the nursery business selling nursery products. So for me, it was like the farm is doing products for sale and, uh, and to eat. Uh, and then the nursery was selling nursery stock. Well, at the end of the year, I get all this stuff bulk. I sell what I can sell. What's left over goes where? Gets planted on the farm. So all of the properties um, that I've, I've worked with directly, personally, myself, have been planted um, at a profit or worst case scenario, break even zero. There's over a half a million dollars of nursery stock planted on New Forest Farm. Where did I come up with that half a million dollars? I earned it by selling plants to other people and that was the profits that planted my farm. Think of an equation. If you're in a situation, I've got 100 acres, I gotta fill it, half a million dollars, oh, it's so expensive. Well, anytime you have an expense, that means somebody else has income because you're giving yours to them. So get on the other side of the equation and say, okay, if this farm needs $500,000 worth of plant material, just think of the money I can make if I plant that farm with 500,000 plants because I'm in the nursery business. Um, so can you see how there's some synergies going on here that we're gonna actually be doing nursery sales here. This is a real business. This is not a shell game. It's really selling nursery stock. I really gotta hustle and sell trees to people. And then the leftovers are getting planted here and this one is growing in the system that's been designed by um, the, the people running those shows. Yes, sir. That's, that's, that's fine. That's fine. I'm not going to talk to them. That's fine. I'm not interested in them. I've got other things to do. I'm planting. This planet is in ec ecological free fall, okay? And if people want to question, and if people want to wonder, and if people want to doubt, I'm busy. I'm going to help to prevent eco ecological free fall. If you are this IRS Schedule F, and you go lease a farm, it's in your best interest to exactly plant it that way because this farm is making money selling nursery stock for that nursery. And every tree that goes on that property, you're both making a cut of the sale. And get a longer term lease. If you're looking for long term leases, go to the Savannah Institute. You know, I'm not here to discuss those details. Like I said, this is a patterning. This is what I'm working with and this is what people are working with all over the place. This model, <sighs> confession time. I bumped into this model in 1980. Two. 
I saw a television news report. A businessman had just gone bankrupt for the second time uh, in, his, in my adult life. And he walks out of wherever. He's wearing, carrying a briefcase that's probably worth $3 million. He's got a, a watch on it that's worth more money than my dad ever earned in his life. He's got an Armani suit, and he walks on a private jet, says, no comment, no comment, no comment. And he's bankrupt. And I'm like, wait a minute. How do you have a private jet and you're bankrupt? Do explain. Instead of the rest of my roommates, we need to protest some signs and this is wrong and evil and horrible. I says, how did he do that? How did he do that? And so, oh, and his attorney, his attorney, did, 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 actually at the time, um, find out who this attorney is, say, hey there, I'm a real estate typhoon and I want to do it just like he did. How do I go? He says, well, you come to our seminars and pay $5,000 to walk through the door. So I did. Who was that person? Take a guess. The great orangutan, okay? This is how the world is set up. And if you aren't using this system to, to advance our values, and my values happen to include earth care, people care, and future care, for real, if we aren't using these tools to our advantage, we're being used by these tools to make somebody else stink and rich and they're making little cracker box houses that blow over in tornadoes and earthquakes and fires in California and they collect on the insurance money and laugh all the way to the frickin' bank because we go and we pay them back again. Who gets bailed out? The banks or the people who owe the money? Hello? This is their game. This is the game. These things right here are all uh, credit. Um, 100% debt financed. I started $50,000 in debt. And guess what? I actually have more debt now than I did when I started. But the asset value that I've left behind of ecosystems that have been restored that actually produce food, fuels, medicines, and fiber way outweigh the debt that I have now. And what happens if I die tomorrow? What happens to the debt? The life insurance policy pays for it. So I can walk across the planet, leave it green and ecologically sound and viable and create real businesses that are growing real food, real nursery stock, and we'll go further on later into it. We're, we're creating real businesses. This is real rural economic development. All of a sudden, we now have this real estate. We're going to have a residential development on it, whether it's a, a home that now a farm family can live in, or if it's an apartment complex, or condominiums, doesn't matter what you do on it, this is how you structure it. Um, these are the, this is the general manager, the general partner, and these are limited partners in this real estate ownership thing. At a certain point in time, as this asset, a good analogy to think about is a shopping mall, the real estate developer builds this shopping mall. You find an anchor tenant. The anchor tenant here is the farm, because this farm is what's going to make it all happen. It's going to turn into this beautiful, you know, paradise ecosystem. Then you, you know, lease out space to you know, Orange Julius and Trucks Unlimited or all these different other shops. They're responsible for their business. So what these guys do, as long as they're, they're going along with the rules that we set up in the first place, they fit into this ecosystem and they, they continue to make this asset more value, valuable. Once the rents get to the point where they're now, there's surplus, there's, there is genuine profits. Profits go into a trust or a family foundation. So you have the tax benefits of squirreling this money away. You should start right away. Start right away populating this part of it. And then event, and has its own credit that goes with it. Um, and then eventually it donates to a nonprofit organization. And the nonprofit organizations that you either start yourself or collaborate with are actually doing the research that supports what you want to do. A quickie example is John D. Rockefeller. They had a lock on making lamp gas for street lights way back in the day. They drilled oil, a standard oil company, all that kind of stuff. And they had a byproduct of making the street light gas that was a clear liquid, extremely volatile, odorless, and poof, it would explode. So for a tax write-off, they take R&D money, invest it into figuring out what to do with this fuel so you don't pay taxes because you're keeping it in your own company. Well, then they discovered, hey, lo and behold, guess what? We can actually just adjust the carburetor on, a, on an engine, and you can use this as motor fuel inside a vehicle. It's like, well, how can we get this product to replace the current fuel in a motor vehicle? I have a great idea. Whoop, we'll take the family foundation right here, and we'll start a nonprofit organization called the Christian Women's Temperance Movement. And we'll hire an executive director, pay her a good salary, and we'll make sure that she's socially connected somehow. So her name was Mrs. John D. Rockefeller. 
and she got a $400,000 a year salary back in 1918. That's not bad. So you keep it at home, you know? Well, so then what did the Christian women's temperance movement do? It railed against that demon rum and it abolished, made a constitutional amendment to get rid of alcohol because alcohol was what the motor fuel was that ran the cars and trucks and tractors of the United States of America back in 1918. And he replaced them with what? Gasoline. Um, this was all this game, all this game. And we go example after example. If you don't believe this, I don't care. Then what you do, then what you do, this, this is one... This is one unit. This is one real estate unit, okay? We have a property that we've now set up. We are now doing a restoration agriculture farm. We're gonna be successional farming, mimicking the natural plant community types, and we're harvesting the yields off of it, starting with annual plants and perennials and berries and fruits and nuts and grasses and pigs and cows and chickens and all that kind of stuff. And we're gonna be building residential structures and commercial enterprises, for real. This is not a shell game. We're doing real businesses. Question quick, because this is not the real deal. This is just so you can understand where the next part comes from. Go ahead. If, if a donation is made to a nonprofit organization, the donor advised funds, if I give a donation to a nonprofit organization, say this money is to be used for this, for example, universities, they, there's these companies these agro biotech companies say, hey, look, you're now going to make a new agrobiotech wing, and here's the $14 million to do it, and you're going to be studying all the chemistry and all the stuff that we need to support us, and you're going to be training all the young engineers that we're then going to hire that are going to be our minions making all the poison that we spray across the planet. But that is public information. Totally public information. And so what happens is anybody can use it, but it was geared specifically to benefit the donor. And so when you hear the report, Oh, yeah, but who funded that research? That's the point. We do. We fund the research that helps us. And if we have set up a system that absolutely hardwires it into what we do, everything that we do supports the nonprofit research that supports what we do, period. And if we're not supporting our nonprofit research to support us, then we lose. Next sta stage of the game, this is one real estate unit. What good is one little piece of property? We want to have a whole bunch of them collaborating with one another. And part of the program is just off the top. Everybody's contributing a little bit of money and sending it down to this place in Washington, D.C. called K Street. Who knows what that is? That's where they keep the lobbyists. How, much of, how many of us have lobbyists? Well, I kind of do, because I support lobbyists. And we want to all program our, our system to support the lobbyists that support what we want. So then we get the legislation that we want. That's how our system works, period. It's part of the game. It's, you want to play the game. It's, it's the game. It's the game. And I'm doing it as a small timer. I haven't had a job since 1982. And out of the however many years it is since then, six of those years, my income has been zero. And every year except two, I've been below the federal poverty level. And that was by accident when I went over it. Sorry. Um, we can do the math, we do the numbers, you set up a perennial ecosystem based on the natural plant community type, look at the ditches at the side of the road, look at the hillsides here, nobody's doing anything to it. And out here there are acorns, there are walnuts, there are butternuts, there's, there's raspberries, blackberries, there's medicinal herbs, there's culinary herbs, there's mushrooms, that if we design a farm like the wild system, it takes care of itself for all practical purposes. We're gonna take care of it by farming in the middle, either with our row crops, we might even be growing corn and beans, or we're, we're grazing animals in that system. What kind of animals? I'm gonna pick ostriches because this is a great example. Yeah, but why should I sell beef for a dollar a pound at, at the feedlot when I can sell ostriches for $15 an ounce? It's like, well, you know why? Because you can sell train cars of beef every single day at a dollar a pound, you buy junk at the sale barn, you sell junk at the sale barn, they have a good life for six months while they're on your farm, and you make 120% return on your investment. So the numbers, we've got all the numbers in there for real estate, for the long-term timber crop, and for these smaller little niche products that are going on in there. What we don't have yet is a lot of real data on farms that are running this whole program, because there's only a handful of us. Do enterprise budgets for hazelnuts, like chestnut, and these agroforestry budgets? 
any enterprise budgets you see in online, they're talking about one specific crop as if apples are going to pay for everything. We know that that's a bastard system. Monocrop systems just don't work. There are too many inputs in order to keep it going at the level that's needed to earn the money that you need to. The um, Michigan State University chestnut enterprise budget is just amazing. You've got to get 2,500 pounds of chestnuts per acre and sell it for twice the market price in order to break even after 20 years. And you're five years into the game, you're $140,000 in the hole on every single acre of chestnuts you put in the ground. It's like, and people are doing it. They're doing it all over the place. So. In this, presen this presentation, probably not. Probably not. So this is New Forest Farms website, very lean. This is where, this is what these kind of properties will look like. You wanna, if you wanna now do a commercial venture in there where part of it's a golf course, is that, or is that or is that not a beautiful golf course? A frisbee golf, you know, horsey back riding, hiking trails, you know, camping, agro eco tour, whatever you wanna call it, there's those commercial enterprises that can take place in there. They, would they take place better there or in a bare, you know, stubble cornfield field. You, you decide which is more valuable. That's what it looks like from the air. What good is one little farm? So I started, once upon a time, I'm gonna grow produce. I'm gonna be this little vegetable cucumber farmer. I'm gonna make lots of money. And I go out there with my little hoe, and I hoe, 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 and I wear my straw hat, and I'm gonna raise a family and build my own house. I'm doing a Scott and Helen Nearing homesteader thing. This is living the dream. And it sucks, and you're not making much money. So I heard about this new cooperative that had formed down the road. It started out with like 65 vegetable growers that were gonna pool their resources and sell it, put, put their vegetables on a truck and get it out of here. And it had gotten fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer. And it kind of held steady. And six of the guys decided, well, you know, in addition to growing the vegetables, we also milk cows. Why don't we take our milk on a Monday morning, put it all together and run it through this cheese factory when it's clean in the morning and sell organic cheese. So they had been doing that for two years or so when I joined the co-op. I was growing number 24 in the cooperative um, and the annual sales were $375,000. A um, couple years later, we buy this little building. This is an empty ghost town in the Midwest. It was bought for a dollar. All of us got together, we fixed it up. It's like the total co-op thing, it was really great. This whole addition here, I, I oversaw the uh, concrete block stuff because one of the part-time jobs that I did is I was a block carrier because I got the shoulders and all that, would carry the cement blocks and watch these guys build foundations. I did the landscape around it. Um, started, we got all kinds of members, and so this is some of our members who are growing produce. This guy was growing produce. He actually died of cancer last year. We've got uh, probably 75% of the co-op um, are folks that have uniforms that look like this. I wonder if their uniforms are a tax write-off. <laughs> Um, eventually, we bought a little warehouse down the road, bought our own internal trucking fleet. The business grew. Why did the business grow? Because we actually produced things, because we actually stuck together. We actually stood side by side. You have different color skin than me and different color hair, and I don't appreciate how you, you color that hair. I know this guy over here goes to a different place of worship than me, has a different worldview than me. We sit down together, we vote. It may go your way and your way and not my way, and I may hate the decision, but I'm sticking by you because I know that I depend on you and you depend on me. We all depend on one another for this racket to work. So I don't really know what caused us to stick together other than the fact that we just doggone stuck together. And, and, the, and the veteran growers, members of Organic Valley who have been around through the years, we are fiercely loyal to one another because this... <laughs> this is the best thing that's happened to agriculture in the 20th and 21st centuries, Organic Valley. Farmer-owned, aggregation, value-added processing, distribution, um, vegetable, meat, dairy, eggs, feeds, um, milk, juice, cooperative. And it's regionally distributed all over the country. And I saw this thing grow from 24 people sitting in a circle around a couple of picnic tables to the, to the organization that it is right now. So the best thing that ever happened to agriculture in the USA in the 20th century. It's also the worst thing, because I don't know if you guys have ever sat through meetings where everybody gets an equal vote, and you discuss and argue and fight and mud wrestle and f all this kind of stuff. There's people at each other's back and slitting each other's throats. Then we get in, we vote, we go have lunch, and we go back to our farms, and it's happy-go-lucky. Dairy, eggs, juice, soy, blah, blah, blah. I gave it away. It's Organic Valley. No matter where you live, Pacific Northwest, California, Mid-South, 
um, you know, coastal Florida, northeast, your label will have your bioregion on it. You know why? Because it was produced there. It's local. Organic Valley products are grown near you. There's Organic Valley farmers near you. Started with, I was growing number 24. There's over 2,000 growers, over 2,000 employees. This was our headquarters building after a while. 600 employees in that one building alone, in that headquarters building. Um, and then the produce program, we had to expand. We started with a six pallet cooler that we made out of styrofoam and, and, and sticky foam. And now we've got this, um, how big is it? Oh, I don't show it, but it's like 150 by 200 feet, five different climate controlled computer, this and that, zones and all that kind of stuff. I can't afford that. But when all of us get together, I can still be a little small timer making $25,000 a year and now I'm, I'm part owner of this big monstrosity. Well then, it expands because we got to utilize the spent hens and the old the cull cows and the steers, part of the dairy program. So then now there's a meat company that I own a part of, um, organic logistics. All of a sudden, once we started getting to a certain scale, it made more sense to have our own trucks and profit from the trucking business in addition to just selling produce or milk or whatever it is. So now I'm a part owner of all these different enterprises that have grown through the years. This is a co-op. This one's a co-op, Organic Valley's a co-op. And I don't like the co-op model, personally, because it's one person, one vote. And this guy's a hobbyist. He, he works at the golf course down in Chicago all week. He's handsome, he's articulate. He grows one box of zucchini, delivers it to the warehouse, and he sits at a meeting. He can make stupid business decisions, but because he's eloquent and wears a suit and has an MBA, people listen to him and vote his way. I'm 110% invested in it. Not only do I grow all of my income from the produce, I'm also driving the truck, I'm also packing in the warehouse, and he's making decisions that hurt me. That's not fair. He's not all in, and I'm all in. Well, then the corporate model isn't necessarily fair because it's who wrote the biggest check. I'm 51%, it's my way or the highway. That's not fair. So I've tried how many different models throughout the years? Oodles of them, and I'll go through part of it. Now what's happened is now this has given us the opportunity because we have the numbers and we stick together, we collaborate with one another, to say no to the free government money that says, look, you can have a hoop, we'll pay for the whole thing. And you say, well, why would I want a free hoop to now grow all my pepper starts? This is how I did my pepper starts. Why would I want to do that when 10 of us can get together? If we put 10% goes to Reuben, Reuben has his greenhouses. Now Reuben has a business that supports his family. He's going to buy the seed in bulk. He's going to buy all the supplies in bulk. He's going to buy all the equipment that we can rent and lease. So Reuben's got a viable business because we all stick together and we agree to make sure that he gets a cut of our action. So I don't have a hoop. I don't need it. I buy my plants from Reuben. It's an expense. So this is a mid-June. Um, we're going to put down some uh, irrigation system. Now, this is what Wisconsin looks like in the summer. <laughs> a problem I hear over and over across the country is like, oh, I'd love to raise my animals organic. I just can't find the feed. Well, what you just heard is if there's something that you can't get, there's an opportunity there. So there was a, there was a um, almost out of business um, feed mill. And so if I go up to this almost out of business feed mill and say, hey, you're going to go organic. And this will be great and it's wonderful. And they can say, look, back off. If 50 of us go to the feed mill and say, okay, look, we're going to supply you with organic this. We're going to give you these many tons. We're going to deliver it over this period of time. You're going to store it for us. You're going to dry it. Then you're going to blend it in with these amendments that you bring over there. We're going to buy it over here. And you're going to make a 15% margin on your business. You think Ernie all of a sudden says, oh, get away from me, kid. You know what? Ernie's like, oh. That's pretty cool, I'm back in business again. So there were enough of us to support. We now have at least four certified organic feed mills, fertilizer input places. I, you can get anything that you want, organic, sustainable, blah, 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 because we stuck together, we pooled our resources and made it happen. And that's its own separate business. Another thing, well, why would I raise my eye? There's no place to sell certified organic livestock. Bing, another opportunity. So me, Mark Shepard, I raised five steers, do I have the wherewithal to go start an organic sale barn? Of course not, but we all get together, say, all right, let's pool our resources and, and start the sale barn. Buy and sell organic um, livestock at organic prices, period. Everything from chickens to pigs and cattle. No sheep, no goats, because they're small, they're ugly, and they stink. It's, it's, it's purely an internal political thing amongst the current members, and no goats and sheep, okay? Uh, then this is a place we lovingly refer to as the Death Star. <laughs> it's not complete, but it's fully functional, I assure you. This is the distribution center. 
Um, so the, the, all this buzz about food hubs these days, dude, we've been doing this for 20 years. This is how you do it. You got to do it at scale for real. 36 loading docks around that thing. This cube in the middle is completely automated, robotically controlled. Whether you're an Amish driving up with your buggy and putting your boxes of tomatoes or cucumbers on the whatever, or if the milk truck is rolling in, it goes in, everybody's got the computer tag, it goes on the machine, and then when the people are walking around the loading dock, loading trucks, they're just taking it out, and it's the proper stuff that came out at the proper time, perfectly aged. Can you afford to do that on your own? No, but together we can. This is another business opportunity. Start to see what I'm saying? We're gonna start by doing this ecological restoration on one property. But what's the point unless I'm working with you and you and you and you? Then we're going to pool our resources and start another business, which is Ruben's Supplies Company. So we get our products cheaper. Then we're going to start our sale barn and our feed store and our, our warehouse. All of these are real businesses. Uh, Organic Valley is the largest private employer in the southern half of the state of Wisconsin. How did that happen? How did that happen? Because we stuck together. Instead of whining about problems and wishing that a 16 brick rocket stove would save the world, we actually grow stuff. And we actually sit down with each other and we argue and fight and go to endless meetings and we sell products. Just the loading dock doors. This is a new office building. The Cashton office building is complete. Oh yeah, renewable energy. Do you think renewable energy is pretty cool and we should go that way? How many of you are 100% renewably energy powered? Why not? If we don't do it, who's going to? Every building, every residential structure, and most agricultural structures can power themselves and heat themselves if you design them that way. And so if you ever build another building and it doesn't heat itself and power it itself, you failed in the design process. So here's this monstrosity. It powers itself. It heats itself. We're getting there. We're, get, we're getting there. I'm building, because what I'm seeing is this collaborative business model is not going to work unless it has the basic foundation of an ecological production. So the ecological production is what's driving this whole thing, is designing ecosystems, mimicking nature will push this whole system. There's the, that's the, this office building here is that right there. Another 350, 400 employees in. I, I, I did a uh, crusade once because uh, the pig being raised for, to go into the organic prairie, organic valley value chain, has to have a 10 by 10 uh, piece of floor area on the inside to keep out of the weather. They can come and go whenever they want, all the food they want, all the fresh water they want, all the bedding they want, they can sleep, they can come and go. And yet the organic valley employees, there's like three of them crammed in a cubicle. And they can only go out at break, and they don't get free food, and it's like, wait a minute, you know, what about fairness to like, human beings, and all of a sudden it's like, all right, this one's not going anywhere, I just walk away from that one. I know there's other places. Back to part of the energy uh, prog uh, thing, think about fuel. Well, all these farms are using tractors and trucks and so on. Organic Valley uses trucks in the inside and the internal shuttle fleet. At uh, one point in time, a whole bunch of us got together, well, let's invest in a biodiesel plant. It's like, for real. So all of us together invest in a biodiesel plant, Unfortunately, the biodiesel plant, the numbers that made it work, the guys who ran this thing, not my business, it's theirs, I just own it. Um, the, the business formula depended on the blending tax credit. It was like 90% of the biodiesel plants, when they first got rolling, were all cooperatively owned by the farms. So what Big Fuel did is they encouraged it and they gave all, they talked to their people on K Street, they made all the laws that were favorable so these things could actually cash flow. So we paid for and we built the infrastructure that all of a sudden when these things became successful, they said, all right, let's get rid of the blending tax credit and most of them collapsed in, in big oil bottom uh, for pennies on a dollar. It was a great move on their part. Well, so what we did at the time then is we just converted and we formed the Farmer Renewable Energy Program and we buy photovoltaics in bulk, we buy wind turbines in bulk, um, we converted our vehicles to run on straight vegetable oil and we've heard of vegetable oil. Did you know what Rudolf Diesel designed the diesel engine, what the fuel was, the original fuel? Vegetable oil. It runs on vegetable oil. So you just do a little modification to it and you can run on vegetable oil. Oh great, I'll go to the Chinese restaurant, get the fryer oil, put it in my tractor and I got fuel. It's like, that's not a fuel system. How many gallons of fuel do you use in your tractor, cars, trucks, etc.? 
how many gallons of oil per acre do you get out of this particular kind of oil seed, that kind of oil seed. Here's the press, here's the, the filter, here's the waterer. Now let's sell the oil to the potato chip company so we're not taking food away from the food system. Fry the potato chips, we buy it back, we clean it, filter it, put it in our tractors and burn it. And then the press cake that comes out of that, we feed to our animals. Design a system to actually accomplish what you want to accomplish instead of like dinking around with one little part of it and get the fryer oil. That's not a, that's not a solution. This is the kind of fuel that you need to run, you know, how many, I think it's 95,000 acres now of Organic Valley farms have been converted from chemical to organic. There's our fuel island. I can go, this is a great thing. Yeah, where I'm in the fuel business too. I go downtown, I stick my cart in here and I can get diesel fuel um, and part of the profits filter back to me. As of 2015, we crossed over a billion dollars in sales. So this is not a, a, a theoretical model what I'm explaining to you guys. I'm talking about rural economic development, but more importantly for the human race is rural ecological resuscitation. This planet is in free fall. We've got to put it back together again and we can do it at a profit. We're going to profit every step of the way, but we can't do it sitting in our own little bunker and growing our $25 worth of cucumbers and making a 16 brick rocket stove. We've got to all stick together and produce enough at scale. Uh, the small towns that were ghost towns around us, all of a sudden now there's opportunities for people to get into business. So the billion dollars that Organic Valley earns, it counts that billion, it deposits it in the bank. The bank now gets to count that billion. It's the same billion, but it got counted twice. Then the bank deposits in the accounts of all the farmers, it gets counted a third time. Wow, then we go spend it locally because we know about local economy. And then the, all of our local businesses that are run by our husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends, they get to count that billion again and it all stays in the system. Starting to follow the pictures, they're coming together. We have our, you know, small town, we have like five different white tablecloth, amazing farm to table restaurants in this town of like 4,000 people. Crazy good food. We've got private independent bookstores. Whoa! You know why? Because we don't buy books on Amazon. You just don't. You go on Amazon and say, look what I want you to buy. So you go buy it from your distributor or whatever, then I'll buy it from you. Now you're in business as a bookseller. It's a little bit more of a nuisance than going but it supports you know, my next door neighbors. Recreational mountain bike cycle fix it things, our own radio station, dirt. <laughs> um, the, the small, the small uh, schools that they abandoned when they upscaled to make regional schools, that one was bought for a dollar. A group of six parents who you know, were associated with Organic Valley bought at Pleasant Ridge Waldorf School. Um, gee whiz, there's a permaculture green space and outdoor classroom. I wonder who had a finger in that pie, right? Um, and then the Landmark Center, one of the first uh, graduating classes that went through Pleasant Ridge Waldorf School, they, they said, we don't want to go to the public schools, let's make our own school. So they do all the paperwork, they file it, and they got refused. They weren't be going to be given a, 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 a license as a private school. Why? because they weren't 18 yet. So they convinced a parent, say, hey parent, will you sign the papers for us and be on our board of directors? So they got a parent to do it. To this day, the Youth Initiative High School that started in one room in the corner of this building is now in three rooms, have students from like 30 different countries that pay big bucks to come to this school because it's one of the coolest schools because the board of directors is run by the students. What it does though, is it crucifies teachers. If you can't figure out how to get along with the kids at the same time as actually teaching something, meat grinder. All these different holistic animal wellness center, one of the greatest little co-ops around, all of the, the neighborhoods and people are like totally into those to grow our cool little groovy food in our yard and stuff like that. Um, this is Viroqua, Wisconsin. Just kind of zip through all these things. Now, but this, what this brings me to is something that really um, annoys me with uh, permaculture. I'm a, I'm a permaculture designer, have been for a long time. My diploma's from Bill Mollison. So he's like, hey, with permaculture, we don't need farms. We'll grow all of our food in our front yard. How long are six cabbages, a ca uh, like a kale plant, three sunflowers, and some nasturtium leaf sandwiches going to last you? We eat a lot of food, at least a pound a day, of carbohydrates, proteins, and oil. Design a food system. These farm to school things, 
why not design a farm to school program that actually feeds the meals that they serve in that school? And you're talking hundreds, if not thousands of acres of farm to school, and that's a real farm to school program instead of a 10 by 10 plot that grows carrots that they boil to death that I hate anyways, and it goes in the soup on Friday. So, direct investing in US farmland. This is data from, um, I just got it off the internet yesterday. Passive investment in farmland gives you about a 16.9% return on your investment. So if we think about rural uh, real estate acquisition, we just know we're going to make 16% return on investment after 10 years. Iowa farmland, look what it's done in the past uh, uh, 10 years. It's, it's a little bit less if you go over 20 years. It's not as catastrophically huge. All the big players are getting involved in, in agricultural land around the world. Why? because there's more people and they're not making any more farmland. Um, so there's all kinds of different opportunities to invest in farmland passively, or we know that we just go buy it and it's gonna be worth more down the line. It's a really good investment. What we have here today is one of our collaborating partners is Kevin Marr. I always mispronounce his name, stand up Kevin. Um, Kevin is working, uh, so here's also how we work. We aren't a top-down, linear, patriarchal company. We're a distributed, networked, uh, freely associating group of, of business people that work together with one another. And uh, we know that our life is better off if we work together than if we work separately. Because it was, who was it? Samuel Adams who said, if we don't hang together, we're surely going to hang separately. And that's where we are, all of us in this room right now, okay? So we're going to hang together. I don't have to like you to work with you. And there's a lot of people who don't like me, and I understand why. I'm a jerk. Get over it. Um, <laughs> but a jerk with a good heart. So part of what uh, Kevin's working with, Agroforestry Management LLC, Agroforestry, Agroforestry Management. So if you're interested at all in being involved on the investment side of real estate acquisition, and if you can at least let your brain think for a little bit, they're getting 17% return on my investment as a passive real estate play, of course, Past performance is no indicator of future, you know, whatever. But this is the way things are looking. Um, because we're setting up farms like this, properties like this, and what we're doing now is we're focusing on specific regions that have certain confluences of events going on, which have to do with a decline in, in uh, farmland asset value, access to rail, highways, and river for transportation of the products from it, and reasonably close to markets to sell it. And most everybody knows of some regions where that's taken place in. So this is what we're going to be setting up on individual property uh, places. Restoration Agriculture Development is our consulting design and installation company. If you have a piece of property already and you want to design it, mimic natural ecosystem um, plant community types and farm this way just as a consultation. If you want just a pretty picture, we can draw a pretty picture, but I hate that. It's a waste of your money and it's a waste of our time. I'd rather get out there and draw pretty pictures on the land with bulldozers and tree planters. So all of these patterns that you see are water management structures to move the water where we want it to safely and store it where we need it for the purpose that we want. Are we going to raise fish? Are we going to feed livestock? Are we going to soak it in and infiltrate the soil, water trees? Whatever our purpose is, we design a system that will do that and we uh, optimize things by making paddocks as parallel as possible on the landscape. Um, so restoration agriculture development, our our basic go-to template is no matter where you live, there are plant community types and associated animals that live with those plant community types that are growing wild on the side of the road and are producing yields, agricultural yields, free of charge. So we're going to plant those. And in these black spots, and anywhere on this map here, including in California, just different players, the oak savanna plant community type is one of them. With the tall trees being oak, chestnut, or beech, we're going heavy on the chestnut because chestnut is a phenomenal product. It's a, it's a carbohydrate that grows on a tree. It's brown rice, it's potatoes. Anything that, that you would use pasta for or, or potatoes or rice or whatever, it's perfect. It makes an incredible dessert. You just make mashed chestnuts and it's like potatoes with a sweetness to it. Um, I've actually contracted with a place in, in South Dakota. This is one of the things that I wanted you to hear, Alice. And we've made Cheetos out of chestnuts. So let's think about, oh, let's educate the, the community so people learn to eat more healthy. That really is a great idea. But 
I've got three bucks and I'm walking to school and I got a hungry belly. I'm going to buy a, the biggest bag of chips that I possibly can and a thing of soda pop because I'm hungry and it's the cheapest I can do. So let's just replace the ingredients instead of having Cargill and ConAgra hauling, you know, container loads and train loads full of corn and beans. Let's fill it full of chestnuts, hazelnuts, pine nuts, acorns that go right to the aggregation facility, right to the processing plant, right into the frickin' Cheetos, and nobody knows the difference. Because once you take that corn to the processing plant, you're not getting corn in your processed food product. It's fraction A, B, C, D, L. It's all these different other chemical pieces that they're chopping apart and putting back together, and you call it food. We do the same thing, but pr produce that raw ingredient on a, on a tree, in a perennial crop. Apples, hazelnut, everything in the prunus family, plums, cherries, peach, almonds, apricots, raspberries, grapes, currants. Notice the annual crops in there. Any corn and beans in that system? 100% perennial. How long will that last? Forever. This plant community type has been in North America 900 million years, or 6,000 years, depending on what reference material you're looking at, okay? This has been here as long as life has been on Earth. These plants are, are they live here, they belong here. Uh, the walnut family, black walnut, black walnut doesn't kill everything. Not if you're planting the right plant community type that goes with it. So we plant plant community types that are associated with one another, that grow together with one another, with minimal inputs, and we use uh, animals as the land managers, or you don't, and we don't have to eat the animals if you don't want to. Hickories, the pines, and the pine nuts. You can get all these plants at forestagriculture.com. If you just want to buy trees and plant trees, edible uh, woody crops, we, we grow specifically for the first criteria we choose for is precocity, early reproduction. If you're a, a plant that I put the seed in the ground, how long do you think, here goes, let's breed chestnuts. How long do you think it takes for a chestnut to start having nuts? <laughs> Pardon? So we got a two years over here and we got a 10 over here. A lot of people think, oh, tree breeding takes so long. If I plant 10,000 seeds between here and the wall, and I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to only take nuts from the ones that produce in one year. Am I going to get 10,000 to do that? No, I might get two or three. But what I just did, I take those two or three and I put them over here. I've just concentrated the genes for fast reproduction. Now, out of those, and I'm going to do this every year, as time goes on, and I'm taking that seed and replanting it, taking the seed and replanting it, all of a sudden, this one puts out four nuts, five nuts, six nuts. The ones that actually have higher yield and higher productivity get higher representation in the gene pool, so we're concentrating the genes for fast reproduction and high yield. Well then what we do, instead of trying to baby these things with organic compounds and all the mycorrhizae, facilio, what's not, we're not going to do an M thing to it. We're going to let every pest and disease go in there and infect it because if you get this disease and die, I'm not interested. If you get this pest and totally make the fruit look horrible, I'm not interested in you. I want the ones that are fast to reproduce, produce a heavy yield, and are pest and disease free the way things are. No inputs, period, and it's just breeding. So every grower that we're working with now, you just understand we're constantly breeding, constantly breeding. So if you want plant material, this uh, forest agriculture nursery, we're a networked nursery. A bunch of us collaborate with one another. Another reason why you should collaborate is we're exchanging genetic material back and forth, both plant and human, uh, that has happened. Uh, and then we're selecting for these high precocious, high yielding pest and disease free plants. The breeding program is not over when these plants get to your place because you're gonna carry it on. You're gonna select for uh, those, those traits that you want. So we're familiar with this now, right? This is one real estate unit. What we, we're, uh, we're not an official anything. We work together. We work together and um, we, so, so we have some contracts, but it's not like fat, like attorney, whatever. Um, and we've had ups and downs and fist fights and people stealing money and all that. It's humans, you know, get humans together and they go weird, don't they? So here's one real estate unit. <laughs> getting rents and leases from these things here. On the properties that we do, there's both the residential and the commercial component of it. That's a lot of money to be made in, in residential and commercial real estate development. And the farming is what's going to take care of the asset. It's going to improve the asset value so that the commercial and the residential occurs in a beautiful, ecologically sound place that really does produce food, fuels, medicines, and fibers, for real, at scale. And we already have this part in place. 
We have all the funds and the, the, the nonprofits to support. Well, RAD goes ahead and designs, helps design those properties and install the tree systems. The genetics come from Forest Ag. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if you, if you wanted to be a farmer, I'm going to pick you guys because I already picked on you. You've got the Common Ground Country Fair shirt, which means you're cool. You want to be a farmer. Great. I, I can't afford to buy a farm, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go farm here. I've got a long-term lease. By the way, did you know that I don't own any real estate? I've leased real estate wherever I go. I lease it from one of these companies right here. I do. Well, now you're going to be a part owner of this farm. Well, you've got to live somewhere, right? Do you currently live somewhere? Do you pay some kind of rent or mortgage? So, okay, so what you do is you go over here, you pay some kind of rent, and you go here and you pay some rent. The rents go to the, the landowner. They just do. That's how the world works. But you've got these, these claws in there that after five years and ten years, we sit down and say, do you want to buy in? Because if you want to buy in, now we take your rents and we just turn it into rent to own. Now you're part owner of it. Do you want to buy in on the, on the nursery? Do you want to buy in on the, on the uh, design and install crew? As a matter of fact, we might need some labor every once in a while to go do a job. And because you're doing this happy hi hippie living in the common unwashed Marxist thing, you're available every once in a while. We go out and we plant a whole bunch of trees and you get paid as a subcontractor. So now what we do is we get all these different farm units, these land units together, we have a problem. And it's, and it's a common problem around the world. And I'll use zucchini and coffee as two examples because a third world example that I've experienced and a, a you know, USA example. You go to farmer's market in zucchini season, you get a $20 box of zucchini or a $20, 20 pound box of zucchini. You try to sell zucchini. What does everybody else have at farmer's market? Zucchini. So, and what is everybody else who's walking around the farmer's market while they're drinking their coffee and buying the, the doodads in a basket from the craft people and not buying any zucchinis, what do they have growing in their garden at home? Zucchini. So we go and we experience the real phenomena that the market, there's no market for zucchini. But the real, the real truth is we don't have enough zucchini to get into the real market. We need to pool that product, get it on a truck, there are distributors and grocery stores that are selling zucchini at the truckload quantities every single day of the week, you know, 367 days out of the year, and twice as much on holidays. Can you fill a truck with zucchini every single week? Bet you, you can't. But altogether, we can, and we can come damn close, and that's called a business. That's the Organic Valley model. All together, we supply, I think it's 14 trucks a week from like May until December of produce is going out of our warehouse. 14 semi-loads a week, that's a lot of produce. Do I pick that much? No, I picked a ton of asparagus last year. Kick my ass, I do that every single year. It's getting t tougher and tougher as my chin goes whiter. So we have all these farms sticking together, we've gotta be able to aggregate our product. Let's use chestnuts again. So the farm now sells to a receiving station. The receiving station um, now has all the processing, it's gonna clean, it's going to, heat treat to, to kill any insect larvae that would be in there and it's just going to store it perfectly and package it perfectly to sell to the value-added producers. Who's going to own the receiving station primary processing? All of the farmers who participate, restoration ag, forest ag, and then private investors. We're entering a new realm of investment that the investment class, some are beginning to understand that you know what? The peasants need a piece of the pie too. Because what we're going to learn as farmers, we're going to get paid shit for our product. Because if, if, if you want to charge too much for it, you won't get into the marketplace. People go into the grocery store, they're buying stuff left and right, but you put it one more penny too much and it won't sell. So we have to be market driven. So that means you follow it all the way back and the farmer gets screwed. Right? Okay, so let's understand that as a fact. We're going to get paid real crap for our product. But because we've set up a natural system mimic, our expenses drop down to almost nothing. And we own a piece of the aggregation company that's aggregating this product and get it ready for market. Then we put these aggregation stations, these receiving stations, now in the Organic Valley model, we have three different receiving stations for produce. The receiving stations then aggregate that product, package it, repackage it, whatever, and get it to the main distribution center that had the big wind turbines and all that kind of stuff. So then it goes to the value added sales and marketing company. And notice what I've been doing here, embedding these little things in it. If you look through here, every little farmer down here owns a piece of every single part of the value chain. Now, if I'm growing 10 boxes of cucumbers and I contribute to this system, 
I'm going to get junk for my cucumbers, but I own a little piece of this company and that company, the trucking company, the, the nursery company, the development, the install company, and all together it adds up to be something okay. I'm 56 years old now. I've been farming produce, organic produce, since I was in my 20s. How many people, one, do you know have been an organic produce grower wholesale for, that's like 30 years now, for 30 years? How many know people like that? There's a handful of people out there. How many of those people have a retirement account that they can retire on? How many of them can get discounted health insurance because they're part of a big, huge buying pool? So when we have this, all of the benefits of aggregating our buying power applies. Um, what, kind of got unfortunate, just another story, but it's part of the truth and it's all part of this decision-making process, is when the whole Obamacare program came in, uh, Organic Valley's like, hey, cool, we don't have to do this anymore. And they like offloaded all the farmers with our health insurance programs. And so then we got thrown into like the mix and the various different states were different. And I'm getting hosed when it comes to health insurance because of the whole politics and stuff. So this would be a little bit more secure if we stuck with that. Does it make this make sense to anybody? Does this seem like an economic opportunity? And when the foundation of it is an ecosystem that's based on the natural plant community types that live in a region and are adapted to the soils and the climate and the disturbances, hurricanes, tornadoes, winds, uh, high water, floods, droughts, they're adapted to that. Fire, let's take Paradise, California. Go to an aerial photograph and look at Paradise, California and you'll see there's hardly a house standing and look at the trees. Those plant communities are adapted to fire. Oh, but these were catastrophic fires. Yeah, because you put these stupid flammable houses there and they went poof. And if we manage that system differently, we help to mitigate those, those um, disturbances. What, what, if, what if we all of a sudden start planting tens of hundreds of thousands of, of acres of mixed open canopy wooded properties and we're going through the soil aggradation process, are we or are we not taking actual carbon out of the atmosphere? So we're doing good. Are we or are we not creating wildlife habitat? Are we or are we not cleaning groundwater and surface water? And are we or are we not really producing food for humans at scale that will actually work and we can get it into Walmart where the people don't think about their food, they just fill the cart full of junk and roll away? Will the world be a better place if we do this? What the hell are we waiting for, okay? Now, <laughs> now we got, go down to K Street, we got some power. We got some political power. We really do. Um, catastrophes. So many people whine, oh, it's the end of the world. People are just going to die and we're extinct in 15 seconds and all that. Well, you know what? Life on Earth is gone. We're killing the planet. No, we're not. We're not killing this planet. What we're doing is we're shitting in our own nest. That's what we're doing. It's making it bad for us, not for the planet. It could care less, really. Maybe it can't. I don't know if it likes it or not. So this asteroid falls out of the sky, thump, boom. And in a minute, 24-hour period, they say an 8,000 degree wall of heat and flame roared around the planet. And if you weren't somehow protected and had some sort of refuge, you're gone. You were gone. Um, but look what came out of it. Did, did that kill the planet? It came out in a different form. It, it, I don't know, sure looks pretty beautiful to me what came out of that. So whatever it is that, that you know, modern human beings are doing to this planet, there's going to be pockets of life. It may not necessarily be our life, our individual life, or even our species life, but this planet's going to come out, it's going to come out looking okay. It's going to be all right. She knows how to take care of herself, or somebody knows how to take care of it, I don't know, who cares? It's going to be all right. So it behooves us to start to create ecological refugia, where we create zones of, of optimized natural plant community types that are adapted to those regions, and one of the most important things is to manage that water on the site so every bit of rainfall that comes out of the sky gets used and circulated in that system. Well, you and I, we need to somehow pay our bills, so we need it to work within the current economy. Would that model work or would it not work? Well, I'll tell you what, it does work. It's being worked right now. You know, Johan, Karen, and Kevin, I wouldn't be here. Organic Valley wouldn't be here if that model didn't work. And what I'm trying to do is trying to, this is primate ecology. 
the, uh, the senior uh, gorilla. He's past his prime. He's got silver in his hair, but he's seen it all. He's done breeding the females, but he's looking around. He's seeing the social structure. He knows who's pulling their weight and who's not pulling their weight. And if someone's not pulling their weight, he kind of like, and he bites him in the ass. It's called a gorilla bite. So consider yourself gorilla bit. It's time for you to get on your game. It's time for you to join with your neighbors and your friends and restore this planet to ecological health, not eventually, not when there's more research, but right the now with whatever resources you have, wherever you are, however you can, and join with others to do the same thing. Because if we do that, and if we do that fast, we got a chance. And if you don't, you want to sit around with your finger up your nose, go for it. This, I experienced this when I was a junior in high school. It was my cousins lived nearby. Mount St. Helens, this was living, beautiful, alive. Kaboom, there was a massive ecological disturbance. It wiped out like thousands and thousands of square miles and buried it in pyroclastic ash, superheated pyroclastic ash. Deathly deadly, right? And within four or five years, these little ecological, biological refugia started over. The plant succession process the underground, the fungal mycelial webs, the stuff floating around in the atmosphere. Life recolonized this absolute massive destruction zone and it began the happy little process of natural succession using what? Species as its toolbox. The ones that are adapted to that particular climate and region and water and that disturbance um, regime. And so what I say is if we go into annual agriculture that looks a lot like that, and it's degraded and no longer getting the yields that they want and we buy the really eroded stuff and the junk, it's garbage property, it's cheap, cheap, cheap. And then if we do it as part of an investment racket or if we put it all in our credit cards, we can take it, we can do ecological rehab much faster, much faster. And the ecological rehab that we're gonna do is based on the species that actually produce food, fuels, medicines and fibers for us. So we harvest them and sell them. We have what's called a business. We have our own personal business, we have our regional business, we have our you know, greater than regional business, we have our national networks working together with transportation and all kinds of goods and services going back and forth. This is how we can recolonize the planet after the zombie apocalypse. And this is like Mount St. Helens, 35 years after the fact. We can get there faster than 35 years. I took a cornfield and turned it into a, a paradise savanna in 15 years at a profit. If I can do it in 15 years at a profit, that means we can revegetate the entire planet in 15 years and make money at it and live a good life and eat really, really well. Another example right here, Poof, Mount Etna. I'm gonna take you up the side of Mount Etna and go right up over in there. It does this uh, every couple of years. It's the most active volcano on the planet. And it torches things fast. See the villages up here? There's actually a village right up in here. The one that I'm going to take you to is San Alfio. It's been up right here. You see how close it is to the badass crap. There's an earthquake there like every 20 minutes because the whole thing is <laughs> and then it goes <laughs> and things get <laughs> torched. It's a seriously destructive place. Look at the power lines, see? They got electricity up in San Alfio. Who would live up there? I don't know. It's a beautiful place. Now, in San Alfio, they learned a long time ago, you know what? It's probably a good idea that we don't build with flammable materials. So in California, it should be against the frickin' law to build anything that burns. Because California is a fire environment. And if you build something that burns, poo, you just paid for the whole fire and we, you know, crucify you, do whatever, drag you through the streets. So we're going up to San Alfio right next to this thing. And this is who we see. This is right here, is one of the hundred oldest organisms on the face of the planet. It's over 4,000 years old. And you look at these little people. It's bigger than a city block growing in the solid rock, the site of a volcano. Now who did this, the site preparation and cover crops and the sprays of the right myceliums and the this and that and the horn twirlings and the cosmic pipe and the dancing at sunrise and the agnahotra and all that kind of, who did any of that? Nobody. This tree fell in a crack in a rock and somehow managed to survive for 4,000 years. It's been producing chestnuts for 3,990 of those years with sheer total utter neglect, stun. Has the largest tree trunk ever measured on any tree on planet Earth ever, about 75, 78 feet across. It's a big tree trunk, makes redwood trunk look tiny in comparison. At one point in time, there's a, this story about uh, a knight 
whose, whose girlfriend, his dad, her, her dad said, you got to go marry this old fart in the village next door. They took her away to marry the old fart. She wouldn't do the deed, so he put her up in a tower. So the boyfriend gets a hundred horsemen together, and they go up to that neighbor looking for a fight, and they walk right in. Nobody was expecting them. They rescue the girl and come back. And as they come back, well, guess what starts happening? Mount Etna's thrown up all the smoke and it's electrically charged particles and there's freaking crazy lightning going all over the place. <laughs> so a hundred horsemen parked their horses in a circle around the base of this tree and took shelter for a couple of days before they went home. It's El Castaño de Cento Cavalli, the tree of a hundred horses. Um, 4,000 years old. I would like to put it out there that if you have to plant your crops again next year, that's not very sustainable, is it? So if we plant a system that lasts 4,000 years, is that kind of sustainable? I think that's all right. Can we build a diet around the oak plant community type that includes oaks and apples, chestnuts, beech, uh, cherries, plums, nectarines, raspberries, grapes, currants, um, livestock, mushrooms? I think we can. <laughs> that's the end of the show. I wanted to leave you with that. So. This, after, this is a special announcement, not that I'm necessarily proud of it. This is the first time, I think, in like years that I actually finished before the allotted time. So there's room for a question and a half. Who raised their hand? For, yes, sir, with the hair. What has the uh, upper management policy at the They're in the process right now of figuring out how to transition to the, to the next younger one because any organization, you think about it, the founders start this thing going. And the guys who figured out a formula that worked, and I supported them in that, and so it was a little bit of a political play because a lot of my you know, compatriots didn't like this play. Personally, all right, George, I love you and I respect you, but how you went about your career in building Organic Valley into what he built it into was not really all that nice. Very manipulative and very good at what he does. And so what happens when a, when a company does that, they get to a stage that all of a sudden the management that got this company going um, they need it to stay together, and they see um, middle level as threats. So they crucify the middle level. This happens organizationally across the board. Almost all organizations go through this problem. Then all of a sudden, if the company continues to succeed, management gets to the point, they're like, hey, we're succeeding now, and oh crap, nobody knows what we do, and we gotta train people to take over. How do we train people to take over without it being nepotism or this or that and the other thing? So they're in the process now that what's really cool, George, the CEO, got into the phase where he realizes that he's the philosopher king now, and he has to, to help with the transition, and, they, and they've, you know, of course they handpick their successors, but they can't officially do that according to policy. It has to be fair, open bid, you have to be qualified. So they're training the next generation and uh, doing the best they can to adapt the fact that there's a glut currently, not a glut of milk, there's, there's a shortage of people drinking milk. And so how do you deal with the fact that milk is driving that business? It's a primary driver of the business and you know milk sales are just down. And so it's a struggle time. Um, yeah, all the organizational stuff that goes on with organizations. Those of you who work for an organization, you know what it's like. Office politics and wah, wah, wah. Sir. In one of the later business webs, they were, they're all leading the kind of value-added products and stuff. Currently right now, when you guys are working with different regions to set up these systems and, and have people kind of feed into them, are the markets already there and such? The, the market, let's take chestnuts as one market. There's about 95,000 metric tons of chestnuts imported into the United States a year, mostly from China, and then from Italy as the second supplier. If we can't beat China and Italy on freight, we have a problem. So if we start now entering into the marketplace competing with those products, well, that's the, the epitome of stupidity. Let's go into a place where nobody has thought to go with chestnuts because they're growing chestnuts Michigan State University style, input, 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 input. It, it, it's cost this much to produce chestnuts. And so they've got to sell it for this. Well, let's let them stay in business because I, I like the fact that they're growing trees. I don't like how they're doing it, but I like the fact they're growing trees. Let's just go start new markets and let's produce them at a lower cost. We'll get a lower yield. Who cares because we're producing such a low cost product. And right now, hazelnuts and chestnuts, the largest use, and acorns, the largest use for chestnuts, hazelnuts, and acorns, at scale, we're talking like silos worth of product that's stored there um, as animals. 
you know, like 85 to 87 percent of our, our corn and beans goes to feed animals. Well, why not feed them tree nuts? It's J. Russell Smith style of tree crops. So, of course, then we're also developing markets for new products. Well, the, the hazelnut, I'm part of a hazelnut gang. We're an LLC. The hazelnut gang is, is doing uh, like uh, uh, pie crusts and pastry crust and oils, that sort of thing, skin care products. And so there's, there's new markets that need to be developed. And that's what's really cool about this is that's their job. I'm not the marketing director of a hazelnut company. I'm not the marketing director of a chestnut company or this integrated you know, nut crop thing. So one of the other, back to the aggregation model here, and I'll just use you know, the, the industry I'm most familiar with uh, other than organic valley is like the hazelnut industry, the walnut industry, pecan, pistachio, you name the, name the tree crop. Let's take apples. Chelan, Washington, Chelan, Wenatchee is where like 75, 80% of the apples in, in North America are grown. Why? Well, because it's a desert, desert. There's water that they can use to irrigate. Uh, there's no, no diseases because there's no fungal diseases, so you just eliminate all those sprays and you, add, you, you concentrate the production, so now it's affordable to ship to the processing place that cleans and bags and sorts and makes byproduct and pie slices and freezes this and ingredient packets that. So all of these aggregation points, like in hazelnut, they call them receiving stations up in, up in Oregon, all of the farms contribute to the receiving stations. Then all the receiving stations sell product to, oops, we've got to one, pack, one back. So the receiving stations now sell to the value-added sales and marketing companies that sell them worldwide. And, and the markets are already in place for these, these products. Here's what's twisted about hazelnuts in the Pacific Northwest. Um, somebody thought it was a good idea that we put what's called a marketing order in place and they all voted to impose a, a marketing board that tells them what percentage of the product has to get sent overseas and what percentage gets to be sold domestically. And so as of the past few years, this marketing order is in place. And if you grow hazelnuts in Oregon and Washington, you've got to. You're required by law to sell 65% of your product overseas. So that means it goes over here, and these guys are selling to whoever they sell to. Well, what just happened in one of the largest consumer markets where there's a lot of people that like to eat things? There was this thing called a tarif, right? These tarifs were put on, and so, of course, what the company did, because they're not owned by the growers, the growers don't have a vote in this, they're like, well, gee, we got to cut costs. How do you cut costs? You cut the pay price to the farmer. And so the price of hazelnuts went from like $1.50 a pound to $0.30 cents a pound. You've got 100, 200 acres of just hazelnuts. You're not, your bets are not hedged. You're screwed, and you've got to ride that out somehow by borrowing more, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, if we're building these diverse systems, we can't be so diverse that we dilute each individual product. So we'll have a restricted maybe five above ground perennial crops, maybe three, maybe four. We don't know. That would be an individual choice on a land parcel by land parcel basis. And then you've got three or four. And if the hazelnut thing's screwy for a while, well, you know what? Let's divert from the pie crust thing. Let's go send it to the pigs or you know, wherever we need to do it. So there's a diversity of opportunities within here. Is it going to be easy? Pfft, no way. Come on, it's crazy. This is real world. You know, we're really going to be producing lots of things. The, right now, the people who are doing the best um, with hazelnuts in the Midwest um, are cash flowing primarily with poultry. Once in the, one of the neat things about poultry, of the people who actually eat meat, everybody will eat chickens. And so there, the demand for chicken being raised in ecological systems that include hazelnut as like a cover for, for the poultry, um, not able to uh, grow enough and cultivate enough relationships with enough growers that are having free range chickens out in, in these particular systems. So our, our challenge right now, and I'm, I'm not kidding at all, the problem right now is we need tens of thousands of acres of multi-crop Chestnuts, hazelnuts, and pine nuts are the first three big ones that would concentrate on the up, uh, up in the northeast. Huge markets, high value markets, and we can't do it with 25 plants here and 25 plants there. We need to do tens of thousands of acres. So since he's not interested in growing up to 10,000 acres himself, maybe all of us can get together and in aggregate invest in the business structures that are in place that allow me to get in for a nickel. And I know that it's happening. Now at home, I've got my 10, 25, 100 plants, but I also know 
that all together we got a thousand acres of these things in the ground and the harvesting machinery is owned in aggregate by us and I know that next week on Thursday it's coming through my place, Brrr, I get my 15 pounds, I get my check. So we get the benefits of the, of the scale at aggregation, processing and marketing. And we still get paid shit because we're farmers. That's the way it is. What's the total investment required to make this thing happen? Yeah. Yeah, but it starts, it starts with one unit, and then it, then it snowballs on. Yeah, you're, all be, you're based on a debt model, so it's a pretty significant exposure. Right? Well, if, if you're going to do it that way, there are people that have resources that aren't, like, in debt. They have called investment capital. And so they become these, you know, the people in this part right here, the investors, investors, investors. And if nothing else, on the investor class, Forget about what we're doing on the land for a while. We're buying agricultural land and we're going to hold it. And we're going to be planting a timber type that actually grows there. We have, have timber numbers that are legit real timber numbers and that's about a 7% return on investment up in the Northeast and about a 16% return on investment on the ag land. 16 plus 7, that's pretty good. It's a long-term play, but what we're doing on the inside, how we're going to manage the property, the property manager, so you don't even have to worry about the management of the property. How we get it managed is you have an opportunity to start your own farm, and you're growing chigs or pickings or whatever you're growing, and you're taking care of all the other things that are part of it. This is your life and your livelihood. You get to be involved in this kind of agriculture without having the $400 million loan that, that I do. <laughs> Sir? I, I have, but um, not enough. And the people I talk to, like, I mean, come on, look at that's simple, right? This is simple. This makes sense. It's simple. And they're like, blah, 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 chill out, man. You know, we want to talk about what kind of bugs you put on the soil and get better yields. We want to get, we want to market together and get higher price for our crops. It's like, okay, thank you. Let, I got, I'm busy. I know, I know. That's what I said. So I probably haven't spoken to enough people. And I might not be the person. Obviously, I'm a little bit rough on the edges. I've been living out in the woods. I've been living out in the woods for like 35 years and talking to the chickadees and the squirrels and the weasels and stuff like that. Um, but I, I know it works. This, 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 is, this is what we can do. We can get there in 15 years. We just have to plant it. We have to have a reason, an economic reason to plant it. And we're, what we're going to do is by planting this, it's going to be real estate value improvement and we're going to be getting food all along the way. Now, question. If you're eating chestnuts and apples and cherries and nectarines and peaches and grapes and currants and raspberries uh, and almonds and uh, certified organic animal products, eggs, dairy, uh, the grass, the mushrooms, do you think you're getting a more balanced diet than if you're eating SpaghettiOs? <laughs> For you, maybe. <laughs> For you, maybe. No, so, so it's, it's an extraordinarily nutritious diet. Now, within that system, let's take any system, right? Within that system, if you guys, whoever's on the ground, managing the ground, if Benoit here, is that how you pronounce your name? I was going to say he's either that or that, but I'm not going to say Benoit. I'm going to say Benoit. So if, if Benoit wants to say, hey, you know what? If I just do a little bit of this on this, if I do $10 worth of squirt, I bet you I'll get $50 worth of return on it. He goes buy some magic goo from whoever the magic goo people are, and he does that. Good for you, man. You're accelerating the program. If you're going to go out over here and you're going to get the organisms, and you spend you know, 10 bucks on organisms and get a $20 gain on that, and it works for you, go for it. But what I'm saying is really you don't have to. This happened as is with no interference. Nature does that. And so if we have zero as our input costs, we may not get the yields that you can get because you're spraying all the magic goose, but I don't have to do all the work. I don't have to think. I don't have to plan. I don't have to do all this testing to find out what is working here and what's not working there or using an organism that has unintended consequences or whatever that is. Just going with what the natural plant community types of your place is a surefire win. I thought he was coming in to kick me out. He's got the big hook. Somebody said there's no, nothing going on in here until 8.30. <laughs> yes, please, Johan, another glass. I'll get it. So, who had a question?
Any questions? <laughs> now, how do we now how do we get the all right? Here's how do we get the organic substitute for Nutella, and how do we get one step better than that? Ecological systems-based Nutella, right? Nutella currently uh, has about 485, 500 million dollars worth of sales in the USA. You put it on the shelf. You put it on the shelf and um, it sells for whatever it sells for. People are buying it left and right, $485 million worth of it. Look at the ingredient panel. What's the number one ingredient? Sugar. Second ingredient, palm oil. Why the hell do you have to add oil to a nut that's 75% oil? This is part of the magic of food. As you take the hazelnut and you squish it, you get rid of the oil, because that oil is valuable. This is, it's uh, one of the highest sources of vitamin E and it's used in skincare products and cosmetic products are all the way around the world. So you sell the oil for top dollar. Well now how do you reconstitute this thing? Well you buy cheap crap oil by clear cutting the rainforests and buy palm oil and reconstitute it and call it Nutella and if it sells for four bucks a jar. It's crack. I love that stuff. I could just eat piles and piles. Well all right. If you want to make a pure hazelnut butter product, you can get them. You grind up hazelnuts, and if you sell the kernels as kernels, it's 15 bucks a pound. So your ingredients to make this jar is going to be $15, whereas Nutella is selling for four. How do I get a product on the shelf next to Nutella? Do the same thing. We press the oil out, now we got the meal. Now we got to reconstitute it. What we're going to add, we're going to add some kind of sugar to it. Where are we going to get our sugar up in the Northeast? First of all, as an aside, colony nesting bees, the honeybee is an invasive species in, in the western hemisphere. Beets, I thought somebody said bees, because honeybees, all of this right here, all of this in North America, this is North America, that's North America, evolved without earthworms and without honeybees. So how about birch trees? How about sugar maple, silver maple, et cetera. So we're getting sugar from a now a perennial crop. We're adding it to this. So let's put a product on the shelf next to Nutella that has sugar as the first ingredient that we're getting from our trees. Now our sugar guys have a place to sell oodles of sugar. We have an incentive to tap more maple trees and manage for long-term maple health. Now we put, now we put in, we, we sell all of that. You bet, we sell every single benefit. Well then you got your hazelnuts that are in there. And your cocoa, well now what we do is we, sit, we, we collaborate with people we've already collaborated with through the whole fair trade organization and we're getting cocoa that's being grown by farmers who actually own a piece of the value chain all along the way, just like us. They're co-owners in our business and we put a product on the shelf and we sell it for four bucks. And if you add up the cost of all the ingredients, you realize that the company just put a product on the shelf for less money than what it costs to produce it. And in the industry, that's called a loss leader. So what we're going to do is we're going to put jars of Nutella on the shelf right next to Nutella. And we're going to sell it at the same price point. $485 million worth of Nutella sales. If some people look at the Nutella and they grab one of our jars by accident, if one out of 100 people grabs our jar by accident, it's a $4.5 million company. And we have sales. We can then borrow the, justify the borrowing and we can justify the reinvestment and the rest of the business that that then sells at a profit. Produce, most produce in, in a grocery store is sold at a loss. It's getting you in the door, it's looking beautiful, it's abundant. Most produce departments and stores aren't profitable. <laughs> All of that. All of that applies and that's the job of the, that's the, job of the marketing team. That's not my job. Pardon? What's the oil? Hazelnut oil. No, not hazelnut oil. We're going to buy peanut oil or whatever. Or what we do here, all right, because let's, all right. <laughs> In East Africa, I work with orphan schools, okay? So these kids go to school and we do a farm to school program. We design food to feed them. Well, we need cash to run the whole program. So we plant 25%. We go out into a desert, okay? 25% of the, of the perennial plants that we plant are palm oil because it grows really well. It makes the most oil per acre around. So as 20% 20, 20 of the whole overall system, we now have cash flow from this oil that's less expensive than you know, peanut oil or whatever. So we're still putting palm oil in it, but it's a different kind of palm oil. Instead of 
uh, decimating the orangutan forests to plant palm oil plantations, we're taking a desert and planting palm as one component in a diversified jungle, then that's a different kind of palm oil, and we sell that idea. Did you say that 65% of your uh, hazelnut crop by law in the north, Northwest has to go be sold overseas? I think that was what the latest number was, yeah. How did that? They did it to themselves. Because what happens, here's what's the real problem in, in agriculture, is guess what? Farmers don't really work together. I'm growing potatoes, right? And I'm, well, there's only so many places nearby that I can put my potatoes on a truck and sell it to the place. Well, you're growing potatoes, and you're going to do the same thing. And so we end up competing with one another, and we drive the price down, and we overproduce because i got to produce more because it's selling for such a low price, and we produce so much that there's a glut in the market. So then it's like, well, now how we can stabilize the price? Let's stabilize the domestic market because we'll limit how much we put into the domestic market that keeps our price up and then we'll dump our crap overseas and we know that it's you know not at a loss but that's where we'll dump our cheap stuff and we'll keep it off the US market so we can keep our domestic prices high let's vote for that okay well, we all vote for it well then you get burned when somebody puts a tariff on your product no no well part of what organic valley participated in and it's not just Organic Valley, but the organic industry as a whole has voted, or they're in the process, I think, of voting now, I don't know if it's finalized, of having a checkoff, an organic checkoff, that you just do this, and a, a piece of, of, of money is going to get deducted from every single paycheck I make, and I don't like that. Oh, because it's going to support, like, the promotion. To support the people in K Street, I want to voluntarily support my lobbyists. I don't want to be told that you have to pay the lobbyists because you're growing the stuff. Um, so the hazelnut growers did that to themselves, not Organic Valley. Anybody have a fire hose experience yet? Fire. Not yet? Fire, <laughs> hose. fire hose. All right, TMI. Alice, water management is critical. Now, now also we have to understand, so, so, uh, I have to understand a little bit about how I've operated is what I started to do when I started doing it, there was basically nobody doing it. Really, for all practical purposes, there's hardly anybody doing it at, at scale also. And so if you're going to be doing any research, if it's going to be valid scientific research, you have to have a control in the experiment. I like that picture, stay there. You have to have a control. And in the control, you do you know, nothing to it, and then you see what it does. So my own personal project, the New Forest Farm Project, that's about as sheer total utter neglect as you can get, and the yields are low, um, and all these different other things, and there's going to be mineral out of whack, and you know all the different organisms are not exactly what they could be. That doesn't mean that everybody has to do that. What I'm saying is that when you imitate the natural plant communities of your area, it takes care of itself for free. Now, Benoit makes the choice I'm going to nudge this part, this part, this part. So what we want to do now is set up this basic system that we know it's going to work because it's wild and natural. Now we're going to figure out how to optimize these different things along the way. and We're going to do it in such a way that we don't bake, break our bank. And so then all of the techniques and tools that we have in our toolbox for nutrient increase, for you know, this in, in, improving the soil life, the mineral, all of those tools are in our toolbox and we can choose to use them or not, but let me assure you that nature doesn't use them, and nature spends no money on any inputs whatsoever. Only the plants that are adapted to that particular site condition can live there, and if you do that, there, there's a surplus. Trees grow. They gain every single year. As they grow through time, then they hit a plateau, and then they go into decline. So all we do is we, we intercept this part of it when there's rapid growth and reproduction phase and that's where we're pulling off our yields and we keep it in that phase through time you can do that with no inputs other than harvest and if you want to get more you can amp it up with all the bells and whistles and bugs which ones at what rates we get to learn that in the next 20 30 years <laughs>